This is just going to be fill in for later, like when I have to change memory sticks. Right, right. What I do, I do the ma the magic from the Hollywood magic, so you guys never know that I'm really changing memory sticks. <laughs> First, we'll have a blessing by uh, Reverend Harry Harris Coat, and now I'll introduce uh, uh, Sergeant First Class uh, Philip Shea. So, let's stand for the blessing. Our hearts are filled with gratitude, O God. We give you thanks and praise <coughs> for all that we have and all that we hope to be is by you and through you. And, and Lord, we pray that we will be instruments of your goodwill that it will be for you. Bless this food to our body's needs and us to your service. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Chaplain assistant. 
and I, I had the important job of driving the chaplain around safely. Um, I had the job of making sure he didn't lose his hat because he left it everywhere we went. And of course assisting with some of the care or the services or whatever we were doing for, for soldiers. And that was back in the early 80s. And then I got out for a, a while and didn't get back in until the 90s. And uh, then I, I decided to do paperwork. I thought I'm a pretty good office person, pretty good manager, pretty good at those things. So I got a job with what's called a 42 Alpha. We all have numbers that tell us what our, our, our careers are, what our jobs are in the Army, our classifications. And so I'm basically an administrative clerk, an administrative human resources person. I think it's called, it's called human resource specialist now. And so I uh, did that uh, while I lived in the San Diego area for, for about a year and a half. And uh, I, I was with an artillery, I'm sorry, an armory unit, uh, tanks. Uh, we would go out and run tanks around in Fort Irwin near Barstow, California. And I would sit in a, a hot armored personnel carrier all day and talk on the radio and, and keep track of numbers and where everybody was and, you know, so forth and so on. Well, I came back to Arizona and because uh, I'm always trying to decide to do something different. So I came back to Arizona and I uh, hooked up doing uh, kind of a cross between chaplain assistant and human resource person with an artillery unit. And we went, we'd go out in the desert down there by Florence and shoot big guns and blow up big patches of the desert. <laughs> and uh, back in the day, back in the day, uh, the land was actually leased, not owned as it is now, but it was leased from a landowner who had cows. <laughs> and they had to make sure all the cows got off the land before we started shooting. Um, because it cost the army, which really meant you, about $10,000 a cow. Oh. <laughs> well, the army finally bought the land, so they got tired of the landowner intentionally sneaking a cow onto the range. <laughs> so that makes the animal lovers upset. It makes the taxpayers upset. It made the army upset, so they just took over the land. And, uh, and then I transitioned to becoming an engineer, and I operated uh, big cranes. And I, I led a section of the soldiers to operate big cranes. And, uh, and uh, while I uh, uh, did that, I actually got deployed to uh, Fort Huachuca right after 9-11 to provide security for seven months. That was my first deployment. And so we were down there for a few months. And then, uh, later on, I volunteered uh, after I, I changed jobs again with the Army, went back to being a human resource person. I uh, came back from my first deployment, got a job working in officer personnel, and, uh, and then I volunteered for deployment to Iraq. And uh, while in Iraq, I did uh, two missions. See, even there, I couldn't just do one thing. <laughs> I had to change jobs. I was only there for a year, and plus several months training. But, but uh, I went and I was uh, in charge at night of Tactical Operations Center. Our mission was providing uh, security, convoy security, to all the uh, contractors delivering food and supplies and items all up and down Iraq, literally from the very north to the very south. We were stationed not too far from Baghdad, about 90 minutes north of Baghdad. And at night, we, we, uh, I, would man, I would operate the uh, operations center, we keep track of our convoys, where they were dealing with, uh, you know, dealing from behind the scenes and back of the base, something <coughs> that might have gone on, attacks, injuries, things that happened on the road. But uh, just managing that whole, whole mission each night, um, keeping track of it. Midway through my year there, after about six months, I got asked to be on uh, a military uh, transition team. I don't know if you've ever read about those little teams that were going around training the Iraqis how to take over. And so I got on a military transition team, and I spent six months, about 23 miles uh, just uh, west of the Iranian border, at an Iraqi base. We lived with the Iraqis. We had a real small compound inside of their base. And, uh, and we lived, but otherwise we lived with them, I ate with them, uh, we visited their, their forward operating bases, their small bases scattered <coughs> around uh, central Iraq, and uh, we worked with uh, the Iraqi 5th Army Division. I was an advisor to two generals and a colonel in their staff. Um, I primarily uh, worked on issues of pay problems, uh, food, water, uh, living conditions, trying to help them do a better job, take care of their soldiers do a better job feeding their soldiers, making sure the soldiers had water, <coughs> dealing with corruption. Uh, my last uh, month and a half there, I flew all around Iraq and Baghdad on Black Hawk uh, 
putting information together that I had worked on, and going to Baghdad and reporting on corruption and uh, contract corruption and how the, the, the Iraqi army itself was siphoning money off the families and not feeding and taking care of the soldiers. Came back to Phoenix after my deployment and eventually I ended up in the job I have now. So that was my little journey in the military uh, to this point. My job is, is what's called the Health System Specialist, the HSS. That's what everybody just calls it. You did HSS, HSS. And uh, everybody knows what that is. A lot of people around the state, a lot of soldiers know me because I have uh, a very fairly high profile job. And some soldiers are glad to see me because they want to get out and get their, their disability ratings and their disability benefits. Some soldiers are not glad to see me because they want to stay in and they want to keep uh, serving the military, serving the state, serving their country. They don't want to come see me because they know that may mean their journey in the military is coming and drawing to an end as far as being an active duty or an active guardsman uh, soldier. Um, I have a staff of, of currently two people, uh, along with myself, um, and uh, we do a variety of things uh, related to uh, helping soldiers who are injured during the week or the weekend while they're on duty. You know, injuries happen. Soldiers are uh, doing duty on a drill weekend, they jump off a truck, and, oh, there goes the back. Some of us that are older, uh, <laughs> and uh, some of the soldiers that are younger, you'd be surprised. Um, I've seen young soldiers uh, take a fall uh, and damage their ankle or knee just doing their, their running for their physical fitness test and literally cannot go back to work for months and months and months. They just happen to hurt their ankle or their knee in such a way they go through a long period of uh, surgery, uh, physical therapy, those kinds of things. So one of the things my section does is we have to document for the Army that all those injuries happened while the soldier was on duty and was not the soldier's fault. It was not neglect or misconduct, but that the Army is responsible now to take care of that soldier's injury. Because if it is what we call line of duty, then that soldier is going to have their medical care taken care of. It's going to be paid for or taken care of by the military. We'll talk a little more about how that works. If it's not in the line of duty, if the soldier was doing something they shouldn't be doing, Let's say it's a motor vehicle accident coming into, into drill. If you have an accident <laughs> coming into drill, you can be covered for all your medical care because you're on your way to drill or on your way directly home from drilling on a weekend. But let's say you have a motor vehicle accident and you've been drinking. And when we get the report, because we're going to have to get the report from the police that says blood alcohol level, point whatever, the Army's not going to take care of it. It's, it's kind of that simple. If you are doing something you shouldn't be doing to cause you to have that accident, your arm's going to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. we're not going to pay for all your care. Okay. It's very different for the National Guard than the active duty, for those of you who are on active duty. Because when you're on active duty, you're a soldier 24-7, and you have medical care. So whether it's your fault or not, you're going to have medical care because you're covered for everything. So you're going to get some kind of care. With the National Guard, it's different. You can see why. We're not on duty every day of the week. <coughs> you don't pay me for, to be a, a guard soldier, we call it a, a, a traditional soldier, for 30 days a month. You pay me for a weekend and two weeks a year, and several deployments and several years later. <laughs> so it used to be two weekends a month, a week and a month and two weeks a year. But it's important for us as a guard, and it's important for my office to work with the units to make sure that if a soldier says, I want the Army to pay for my injury, take care of me, and my lost income because of it, that we know that the Army is responsible. Because we don't know when you got hurt and where and how, to make sure it was while you were on duty doing things for the Army. So that's part of what we do, is make sure that those soldiers are identified and those soldiers do get the care they deserve. Something else we do is sometimes soldiers uh, are injured or ill or have a disease, and our doctors, we have doctors that work on the weekends, just like the rest of us, our drill weekends. We have Army doctors who put in their guard time. And they are responsible to... <laughs> Am I done? <laughs> those doctors are responsible to make a determination if those soldiers can stay in the military. Because obviously if your back is hurt too much or your knee is too damaged, if you can't wear 
what is really about 80 pounds of full combat load with your vest, your equipment, your ammunition, your weapon, all your gear, your Kevlar, which is your helmet. If you can't wear all that and run around the desert, we really can't use you in the Army. We need you to be able to deploy. We need you to be able to do all the things physically that you need to do as a soldier. Even if you're an office person like me, you still have to do the soldier stuff. You have to be able to run and jump and hide and do everything else. So, so what we do is we do a medical review that my office manages. We collect information on that soldier's medical condition and we decide if that soldier can stay in the National Guard or needs to be separated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about caring for the soldiers. That's another thing we do. Now, another thing we did is we already know the soldier's not fit. We know the soldier can't stay in the guard, the injuries are too severe. And we have two kinds of soldiers in this situation. One is a soldier who just came back from the theater or got evacua evacuated from the theater, and they stay on active duty orders. They don't come back home and go back to work and all that. They stay as an active duty soldier. Army pays them every month, and their family gets all the active duty benefits that active duty soldiers get. But they either stay at a military base, Fort Hood, Fort Riley, Fort Irwin, somewhere, Fort Huachuca. They stay at a military base, and they get treatment there, and their care there, and they stay in housing or barracks or whatever is appropriate for them there. The family can go there if they need to, and that's where they stay and get treated. And it's, a, it's amazing to me that uh, I've been back in deployment about four years. I still have a couple soldiers that are still on active duty orders from my deployment that I'm still tracking for care. Four years later, still at an Army base or at home getting treatment for the Army. And that's the other kind of soldier. A soldier that needs treatment but doesn't have to stay at <coughs> a military base. And for most reserve soldiers, this is what they get. They get community-based care. And it allows them to come home live at home, see doctors at a military base near them, or see civilian doctors that, are that they're referred to by the military. But they're able to go home, stay on orders, and recover. And if they're able, they have to go to an armory, go to a place where we have a unit where we do our, our National Guard business, or out to Luke Air Force Base, and they will go out and do some work during the week within their physical limits. It might be four hours a week, it might be 40 hours a week. One of those soldiers works for me four hours uh, a day uh, because that's what her limits are. So part of what I do is I track those soldiers and we keep track of their cases and we do things that the state needs to do for those soldiers that the Army, what we call the big Army, doesn't do. Uh, things like when it's time for them to uh, get promoted, we help them with their promotion packets and, and to get on the promotion list. So we think we do for them. Now those are the soldiers that stay on active duty. Um, they still belong to what we call the big army. We just kind of partner up and do other things to help with that. The other soldier is a soldier that is not on active duty orders. They came to drill one weekend, they got hurt, or they came to drill and said, hey, I've got a problem. They go see the doctors, and the doctors <coughs> determine you are hurt way too much to stay in the military. We thank you for your service. But we can't keep having you come down here and doing duty. <coughs> That's mental to you. And you can't provide the service the Army needs to have a ready force, to have a force that's ready to deploy, ready to serve the country. So those soldiers are going to get what we call medical boards, medical evaluation boards. And we go through a process I'll talk a little more about where we determine what injuries the soldier has that will not allow them to stay in the military, first of all. Then we look at those injuries, they might have two or three, say, which of those injuries is the Army's fault? We, we talk about soldiers being broke, we talk about the Army broke you, and we kind of ask, well, which of those conditions, or those three things that, that are putting you out of the military, did the Army do, or happen to you while you're on duty? Maybe two of those. Maybe one of them, like diabetes, Army didn't cause. But maybe the other one, the back one and the PTSD, those are called line of duty. So now we say, okay, we're going to have a medical board look at you and confirm that, <coughs> and then they're going to let another medical board look at you, and they're going to say, yeah, you can't stay in the military because of your back and your PTSD, and we're going to give you a 60% disability rating, and we're going to put you on a disability retirement list, 
and you're going to get some money each month from the Army for your, for your, for your disability. And if you need to have a disability rating from the VA, but at the same time we do your Army rating, we're going to do your VA rating, and the VA is going to give you some money. And if your disability is from combat, or if your rating from the Army is more than 50%, we're going to let you keep a little of the Army money and the VA money. That's new. We didn't always let you keep both. You had to take the VA or the Army's money. And they always took the VA because there's always more. Mm -hmm. If they already have their VA ratings, then we're fine. It goes a little faster, and, and the soldier can get their ratings, and they get a retirement list. And then up to, for up to five years, every year, so the Army can reevaluate you to see if you're getting better, worse, staying the same. Okay? That's another piece of what my office does, is we manage that process of all the soldiers getting through the disability system. Okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's what I do. Um, that's my background. We're talking about soldiers who, who are injured. Now I can bring any one of my soldiers in here. I can bring, bring, guarantee it. Bring them all, any of them in here. And they will all tell you that the Army system, military system really, but the Army system, what I'm here to talk about, is broke. It's been broke a lot. How many of you have heard that the system for taking care of our injured soldiers is broke? I'm here to tell you, yes it is. It's better, it's better than it was, but it's broke. Who, who can remember, who can think about when it started really getting better in, in more recent history? What happened, what issue came up, and it was in the news, that kind of started to turn some things around? Walter Reed. What did they just close down? Walter Reed. Yeah, the Walter Reed uh, story. And uh, General Franks put a committee together and started working on what's wrong, what's broke, why didn't this work? Well, we, we all could have told them. We all could have told them. And I'll tell you one of the biggest things is there's not enough doctors and resources available to take care of all the soldiers that are hurt. That's, that's the big part of it. It's just not enough resources to take care of all the soldiers that are hurt. And so the system for caring for our soldiers got terribly backed up. And I'll tell you some, some things about that from a personal standpoint here shortly. The system is broke. And when the system's broke, it takes broke soldiers and breaks them down even more. Because they're having to wait so long for those disability ratings. Keep in mind, all that time they're waiting to get a disability rating and maybe get a little money coming in because they're also finding it hard to work or impossible. They're waiting for this rating and waiting for this rating to happen. <coughs> and they're not getting that money. And so it's creating stress for them, stress for their family, creates pressure, pressure and, and, and concern about the unknown and what's going to happen. In the meantime, the Army still wants them to come in every, every weekend a month, you know, <coughs> once a month, and perform duty or show up or do things. And they don't really want to be there because they've been neglected in, in sometimes more than one way. And so it's causing more stress, strain, and damage to our soldiers. <coughs> and I'll tell you what, the broke system almost broke me this year. I mentioned the things my office does. And I you know, I know you can't relate to how much work that may or may not be. <laughs> Let me give you an example. We, uh, for this calendar year, we are investigating, we investigated approximately 756 injuries in the National Guard that happened here in the state. Wow. Just this year. All those have to have the paperwork done, investigate, not, not necessarily a big investigation, but medical documents brought together, reviewed by my staff, sent up to our colonel, <coughs> to be reviewed by the colonel and signed off as in the line of duty, not in line of duty. Some of them are formal investigations <coughs> that have to go up to National Guard, and they have to review it. We're, we're, uh, the last number I saw was uh, 756 this year. Gives you an idea of the volume, and that's just soldiers getting hurt here. The number of soldiers in a unit made up of soldiers that are waiting to be get their medical boards, get their disability ratings. We already know they're traditional weekend warriors <coughs> waiting to get their medical boards done. And the soldiers from Arizona that were injured in theater that are still on active duty in a warrior transition unit, either home-based or out of military base. How many do you think? Take a shot. 
3,000. No, not quite that bad. <laughs> we have about 5,200 soldiers on the Coast Guard soldiers in the state. Well, for the last two years, while I was running the unit, because I didn't tell you that, for the last two years, I had to run that unit on top of everything else. Do all the things you do when you run a National Guard unit, all the process, take care of the soldiers, all everything. That unit has never gone below about 105 and goes peaks at 120. So at a given moment, we have approximately 150 soldiers that are waiting for medical boards or getting treatment having come back from theater. Okay. That number hasn't changed. So that system, taking care of that many soldiers without adequate staff, meant I was part of the problem. I was not getting these soldiers processed quickly. I was not getting their pay done efficiently and timely. I was not managing <coughs> the programs that pay them while they're getting treatment. That's something else we do. We have a program called incapacitation pay, where the soldier, if they're getting surgery and can't go to work, can't go to drill for a few weeks or months, they can apply for that program and we can pay them for their lost wages up to their basic pay as a soldier and how they so they can't get paid more than what they would in the military, even if they have a job as a police officer at 7000 a year. They're only going to get what they make as a soldier. And I'll tell you, it almost broke me. There's a program I'm going to talk about called uh, Master Resiliency Training. We're going to talk about resili resiliency. And my joke that wasn't a joke when I took the class was I, I signed up for this class about almost two months ahead. They were doing these classes part of a program to train NCOs, train sergeants and officers to be resilient, to deal with stress, to deal with pressure, to deal with what's going on in your life and to help your soldiers deal with what's going on in their life. To not be beaten down and defeated by the problems, whether it is something like PTSD or a physical <coughs> issue or whether it was just stress, financial stress, family stress, divorce stress, whatever. And they're trying to train us to take care of these soldiers and train each other to take care of each other. And I signed up for the class because obviously I deal with a lot of very high risk <coughs> soldiers, high risk soldiers, um, lots of suicide potential in my population. <coughs> well, I signed up to get some more skills. Well, by the time I got to that class, I was so beaten down by the demands of the job, I needed the class to get me through. I was at that point. I was at the point I didn't go to work a couple days just because I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. <coughs> exactly what I told my boss this but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. And, and it got to the point where I finally started to tell them, I got past my pride. I remember an officer telling me this once about his PTSD. I, I, I deployed with him. I'd known him for years. Finally walked to my office one day and said, Sergeant Shea, can't do it anymore. I try to pretend like I don't really have his PTSD, like I can deal with it. It's okay. Just, I finally got past my pride. I know I can't do this anymore. I need a medical <coughs> to get out. I need to take care of myself. And that's where I got, where I finally started to tell my bosses. And, I, and, and you'd be surprised how many people I told before someone really started to listen. <laughs> um, I started telling them, I says, man, I just can't take this anymore. I could just, it, it's so hard to come in. I was coming in, I mean, you, you can ask people. I was coming in depressed, hunched over, frown on my face. It's kind of how I look anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> <coughs> I tell you, when they took a lot of the work away from me, when they took running that unit away, I, I'm kind of proud to say, though, it took a major and another NCO to do just one of my two jobs. <laughs> 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 so, so they took that away, and they're doing a much better job at it, because I wasn't doing either job well. And that's how it is in the military. It's just how it is in your family, in your neighborhood. The military is a family. So when we talk about resiliency, when we talk about wounded warriors, when we talk about behavioral health, we talk about people being sick in the military, it affects all of us in the military. It somehow bleeds over to your coworkers, your supervisors, and certainly to your family, and maybe your job where you're at. Um, let me read something I think the general wrote. Um, uh, our uh, adjutant general, uh, General Salazar, 21st century society and the newest generation of service members specifically is faced with the challenges of everyday life that are magnified and exacerbated, exacerbated when serving in a combat environment. Increasing frequency of stress-related issues and suicides have brought 
into focus the need for leaders to identify and appropriately respond to an individual who may be signaling their <coughs> assistance. So let me talk briefly about what we're doing in the Guard, about the issues that affect us, affect me. Um, first of all, the Guard is focusing on resiliency, a term that is defined many different ways. And when I took the class in this, everybody had a different way of putting it. But this is kind of the way they, they kind of, uh, uh, I think, crystallized it so we all could relate to what resiliency might mean. We want our soldiers to be tennis balls, not eggs. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've heard this illustration before, and maybe it's been used other ways, but that's what we use in our class, that's what we share with each other. Because we want you to be a tennis ball and not an egg. Because what happens when you throw an egg on the ground? It breaks. It breaks. It breaks. You ever been in those egg fights, throwing eggs, oh, yeah. and you catch it, and it breaks, and it makes a mess everywhere. Not only is the egg broken, but it gets all over you and other people standing around, it makes a big mess. And you know, that's how it is when a soldier is not resilient, and when a soldier is not able to deal with what they're facing, and they start falling apart. It doesn't just get all over them. It doesn't just affect them. It affects their children. It affects their family. It affects soldiers in their unit, and their unit's ability to be strong and be effective. It gets everywhere. Does. But we want our soldiers to be resilient, to be like a tennis ball. When you drop it, it bounces back. When you drop it, it bounces back. We want to keep that tennis ball in shape and ready, not only for deployments, but to face life. And that's one of the things <coughs> that I think has changed a lot in the military over the years. Is I think for uh, a long time, and I still see it. I still see it uh, in, in some leadership today, where a soldier is a piece of the army supply. Piece of the <coughs> so it's just a soldier, a tool to be used, be here, suck it up, don't want to hear about it, just be strong, get your job done, do the mission, that's what's important. Then we started hearing about mission first, people always, and this concept of, well, we really ought to take care of soldiers, creep crept in. Now, with the issues that are so prevalent in the military, with the soldiers having been to so many deployments, you know, four out of ten soldiers that have deployed have been multiple deployments. So many deployments, sometimes long deployments, sometimes short deployments, so many, so many things going on. And you add to it the stresses back, <coughs> the economy, jobs, everything else, it's just becoming too much. And now the Army's starting to talk about how we take care of the whole soldier, how do we take care of the soldier's family. And resiliency is, is one of the ways we're trying to, uh, to do that. Trying to look at how to help the soldier with their emotions, socially, spiritually, family, physical, those areas, looking at all those areas. Not just being ready to go fight, being emotionally ready to fight. And emotionally ready to be a good father, to be a good mother, to be a good son, to be a good daughter. Because the Army, like a lot of organizations, is built on a hierarchy, it's critical that the Army's leadership learn how to be resilient and teach others to be resilient. And so this class I went to was probably about the sixth class, it's a week-long class, sixth class they did over the course of the late summer and early fall, and 30 or 40 soldiers in each class. Their idea is to train a lot of us to go out and teach others how to be strong. And, and the point here is the Army is starting to realize they need to be proactive. We need to not just be concerned about fixing a soldier who we break later on at, during a deployment or down the road, but we need to help soldiers to be strong and healthy to get through those experiences of life, to get through those deployments, and come out of those situations in a healthy way. I see, I see the behavioral health issues in particular uh, come across my desk and through my office and my attention in about four different ways. Um, one, obviously, is PTSD. We see a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. <coughs> Now, is post-traumatic stress disorder anything new? Is this like just a brand no. new thing? No. How, how far back when you think of wars do you think this one? Civil. My <laughs> lady. Is this what they used to call shell shock? Shell shock. Battle fatigue. Mm -hmm. How many, how many uh, know or thinking back and now kind of putting the pieces together go, hey, I, I know somebody that came back from, from uh, a war, or I, uh, my dad, or my dad's friend from the Korea War, or the World War II or whatever, yeah, they, I can see now they had some issues with it. But you know, they just had to suck it up, 
Get mm -hmm. back to work. Get yeah. busy. Okay. Can you give us some idea of what's being done, how it's being handled? Because I think we have a pretty good idea that there's a big problem. You know that I mean, I'd really, really like to hear what, what's being done, you know, how, how specifics about um, you know, how, what, how the counselors are dealing with it. And um, I guess there's some new um, veteran VA centers around the valley, several. You know, where they were located, how do people find those? Um, okay. Just, you know, and what specifically make health to feel better and cope? And, and along with that, uh, let me just share a couple, couple of things about other conditions that kind of oftentimes dovetail with PTSD. TBI, traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. I think we've had, I was here one time, I think you had a speaker on that. But traumatic brain injury oftentimes becomes a, an additional condition with the PTSD. We also see a lot of suicidal ideation, and uh, again this year in the Arizona Guard we've had three suicides, so we have the suicide depression issues. And then also in the military we're seeing more and more soldiers who are recruited, and sometimes just before they are even able to get through basic training, exhibit behavioral health problems such as uh, bipolar issues, uh, depression disorders, and so forth. And so I, more and more I'm seeing myself, seeing me myself deal with cases where we are placing soldiers out of the military medically that are still very young for behavioral health conditions that have probably <coughs> developed prior to coming to the military. So those are the kind of uh, uh, mental health issues I, I more often than not see. Uh, I've already talked about line of duty. It's, I know it's next on your sheet. We'll kind of pass that. It's just important to remember, whatever the Army does or the VA does in treatment, to some degree has to go back to, was it line of duty? whether it's behavioral or physical, was it a condition the Army is responsible for? And the VA and the Army provide treatment in different ways, and sometimes the VA will treat a soldier that the Army will say, no, we're not responsible for it. Sometimes the VA will say, no, we think it is service-connected, we're going to provide treatment for it. Um, I'll kind of skip this part here about the disability evaluation system, because I kind of did that in my introduction, talking about how soldiers uh, Ultimately, if they cannot stay in the military, uh, are processed and evaluated for what type of disability benefits that they're going to need and what they should receive, what kind of uh, benefits in terms of income they might get. And if they do get disability benefits over a period of time or permanently, their family also will qualify for um, medical care while they're, uh, while they're disabled. Let's go to, uh, uh, I think it's the third page. Let's get into uh, caring for the wounded soldier. I talked about resiliency training. So the Army is doing that, try to help soldiers to uh, help each other, be strong themselves, helping soldiers identify soldiers that are in need, identify soldiers. We're constantly trying to learn how to identify soldiers that are at suicide risk and how to deal with them and knowing how to get alongside of them, take care of them, or physically take them somewhere to get care. Uh, family readiness groups are an important part of taking care of the soldiers before and during the deployment, keeping families working together. And the Army uh, has done some things to make sure that these family readiness groups are more professional. As it used to be, they weren't a lot of help to the soldier who was deployed because there was a lot of bickering and arguing and gossiping. And so they've made some changes in the program to train leaders, <coughs> train the family members how to run their groups, how to keep it focused on taking care of each other and taking care of the soldiers. There are conferences now. All of this is part of uh, a new movement in the Guard here locally and around the country taking different shapes and forms called Total Force Team. And Total Force Team is a mixture of all these things, resiliency training, family uh, readiness groups, conferences, marriage conferences, youth conferences, um, uh, non-professional counseling, financial counseling. We have a financial counselor that helps soldiers with their financial stress by providing <coughs> training, education. This counselor charges $200 an hour. They're getting it for free. So all these things that are listed here on the sheet are programs that fall under what we call the total force team. And I know that if I have a soldier who needs PTSD care, I can call anybody on this team, and they're going to get me to the right resources. They're going to get me to where the soldier can get help, whether they need a mixture of help, or whether they just need some kind of counseling or some type of medical care. 
sometimes we just have to grab that soldier, get him down to the VA, or get him to the nearest hospital, and get them into inpatient treatment for the next few days to be able to find out what to do to uh, help them further. <coughs> so I'll let you have that list, just to say that uh, the Army's doing a lot to create a, a, a menu of services to help these soldiers to be strong, to get the medical care, get the treatment they need. Let's talk then about the treatment itself. Um, I have a question, please. Mm -hmm. What's so called non professional counseling? What does that mean? Well, they're social workers, they're trained social workers. Um, they can provide uh, a kind of a cursory psychological assessment. We also, we have two counselors on staff, and one works with primarily children, one works with the adults. Now, they tag team, because they're not always there, both mm -hmm. at the same time. <coughs> but they're actually on staff full time, and we actually put them in a place uh, in one of the armories near 52nd Street where there's a to totally separate entrance. So soldiers, families can go see them at Behavioral Health. They have a whole office over there dedicated to Behavioral Health. So they can go in and see them without having to walk through the armory, walk past their co workers, walk past their unit, walk past the other soldiers. They can kind of get in somewhat discreetly. So well, that's professional counseling then? Well, uh, it's, it's, I call it non-professional. I think that's what they call it, but in other words, they're not psychiatrists, psychologists. <coughs> they can do, they'll do counseling, but it's not psychological, it's not a psychiatrist, it's not a, a PhD. Does that make sense? Yep. Is that the wrong term, non-professional? I don't know. I, I've just never heard of non-professional counseling before. Either yeah. it's professional or it's, it's I don't know. <coughs> Like a lay, a lay counselor, is that what you mean? Like yeah, well, yeah, I mean, they are social workers. They have degrees. Oh, they're social workers. Okay. They have degrees, so they're but they're not, they're not uh, psychologists. Okay. Like that. And they have to make sure they make that differentiation when they give care. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. let's talk a little bit about how our soldiers do get care. PTSD often presents itself, as I said, after the deployment, maybe six months later, or maybe a year later. Um, it often has a mixture of uh, symptoms, um, depression, anxiety, um, uh, uh, inability to sleep, um, high, high arousal, just alertness, constant alertness. Um, it's part of the problem with sleeping, constant alertness. Um, dreams, memories, um, flashbacks. Um, you know, soldiers will tell you some of my stories about driving uh, the wrong way down a freeway because that's how we did it in Iraq just go into a, sort of a place where they think they're there. Uh, an article over here with a soldier who, who saw, uh, who, who at night would get up and go to parts of Phoenix looking for bad guys. So sometimes it gets very severe, sometimes it's not that severe. What's important is it gets spotted and recognized. And some of the ways we can treat that, uh, first of all, is that uh, that's one of the first places a soldier might go to get care. They have uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom clinics there. And then go to those clinics and, and, and somewhat discreetly, uh, anonymously, they can go there and, and be part of groups uh, where they can work on their, their issues. They can see sometimes social workers there, sometimes they can get connected to a psychiatrist or psychologist at the VA, but oftentimes they go to the clinic and they deal with social workers and work through their issues, talk through their issues, sometimes spouses go, sometimes not. Uh, it's not unusual sometimes for them to go to these group meetings and find veterans from previous wars mm -hmm. uh, in groups, sitting with uh, veterans from the Vietnam War, for instance. Some of the veterans from these recent wars are also Vietnam War veterans. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of them. <coughs> so one, one source of treatment is, is the, the counseling and the groups, the OEF, OIF clinics. Something new is mentioned back here are these vet clinics that they've opened up uh, uh, in a couple places around town, one particularly in Peoria that's uh, have a newspaper article on here. And uh, they're providing some treatment to these soldiers. Um, and providing an atmosphere to, to provide treatment to help these soldiers work through their PTSD and, and to some degree the TBI issues, although TBI is more of a ph physiological issue. Um, the soldiers uh, that are most more severe, that need more intensive treatment, um, usually have an option, a two or three options that counselors or psychologists will give them for treatment. Um, one of those options might be to come into the session each week and recount their stories. Every week come in and recount and recount and recount their stories. 
Um, another treatment plan, uh, as I understand it, involves um, the soldiers having to face their fears. Um, if they have problems with going places where there are people, they're forced to go places where there are people and to confront the fears on a day-to-day -day basis and address those and come back to counseling for those. Some of those treatments are very <coughs> difficult for the soldiers. Um, and one of the problems we have with these soldiers in their care is how well they connect to the counselor. If the soldiers do not connect well with their counselors, it doesn't generally seem to work well. And I hear that story a lot. Is <coughs> now you're talking about social workers? They aren't they aren't educated enough to be able to to do those groups. That that may be true. I think they are trained to do, do the groups, but even the psychologists. Yeah, they're trained to do the groups, mm -hmm. but they don't have the education to be able to help those people move beyond telling their story. I'm a member of a 12-step group, so I know what that does. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not enough what you're saying, mm -hmm. as far as I I'm concerned. No, and 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 again, a lot of soldiers will tell me because I talk about what what's working, what's not, how they're doing. And they do, a lot of them tell me, I just couldn't connect with that doctor. Or in some cases, mm -hmm. I connected with the doctor and then he left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can connect it. with the next one. So I do, I do get a lot of that. Um, I'm talking to a couple of soldiers that are going through these intense cares right now, intensive kind of uh, reliving, PTSD re is a, something that's really severe. Yeah. Because I've had quite a bit of it in my family. And, and what you're saying doesn't comfort me. No, and, 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 and some of the soldiers aren't happy with the fact that their doctors are focusing on drugs. Mm -hmm. Some of the doctors will focus on drugs more than counseling. Mm -hmm. And the drugs have all the side effects as well. Mm -hmm. Drugs <coughs> keep them from sleeping. They sleep too much. So some of them are struggling with the fact the doctor wants them uh, treated that mm -hmm. way primarily, which really is dealing with symptoms more than treating the soldier. Yeah, what can uh, first years do for you? Pardon, pardon what can first year members do for you? You know, we can <laughs> help you in any way in your organization. What can we do for you? Well, you, you members? what you can one of the things that an organization like like First Church can do is look into uh, an organization called uh, Arizona Coalition Coalition for Military Families, and it's listed in your paper here. I gave you the website. I think it's on page four, but I gave you the website. It's the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. <coughs> That coalition is one of the things the Guard has done over the last uh, year or two years to bring together a whole range of faith groups and non-faith groups, hospital groups, TBI groups, PTSD organizations, bring them together in a, in a kind of a loose coalition to work together, to share resources together, to not overlap what each other does, and to try to help each other develop solutions, programs, share information, share, share solutions. And through that organization, this church or other churches could make a connection and the folks there, part of the Total Force team again, can talk with you about ways that you can help here in Arizona with the Arizona Guard. Ways to support the families, ways to support the soldiers, ways to support the children. Yes, um, I see a real problem with some of these soldiers coming back to Iraq. You know, we're in a recession in this country. Um, what are we going to do with all these soldiers that are coming back trying to find yeah, we, we actually have a, a job center in my building now at 2nd Street. There's actually an office there to help with employment. It's a tough issue because um, it, when you work for the government, and in this case, working for the government and trying to care for soldiers, particularly soldiers that are injured, at the same time realizing our mission is to have a ready force to serve the country, realizing we're not an employment agency, we're not a welfare agency. We're not an entitlement agency, we're not a benefits agency, we're a military. But as, as, as I think we've seen it creep into schools, military realized it had to do more than just military things. It had to start taking care of the whole soldier and the whole family. And so we do job fairs. Um, the employer's support for Guard Reserve usually puts on one or two job fairs for a year. Uh, other groups have worked with us uh, to do job fairs. Workforce Connections is another group working with the Guard. And they, uh, they actually are the group that works in that, that, that employment center. But what we're trying to do with some of that employment help is trying not to, we're trying to make sure that when soldiers are offered uh, leads for jobs with companies, the companies are ready to hire. 
Because one of the problems we had is, is soldiers getting referred by agencies out to employers that were not hiring. They have jobs. And they're just running around. So one of the things they're doing in the office there is they're trying to make sure that they have worked with employers around the valley and the state that, have, that are offering real jobs that are really open right now. And then they can tell soldiers, some of the soldiers are like me. They were engineers or their office. Some of them are a little harder to employ. They maybe weren't employed before they went on a deployment. Then they went on deployment as an infantryman, came back, need a job. They don't have a lot of marketable skills. Um, I, I know some soldiers worked very little before the deployment, if at all. They come back, finally they're done with the Army, sending them somewhere, but they're also done with their income. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find them jobs, but send them to companies that are hiring, and, and so we can actually have a success rate of getting their jobs. I've had a uh, In the mid 90s, uh, I moved from Phoenix to, to Florida. And at the time, I was a coordinator of a, of a 15 bed, 90 day transitional living program for homeless veterans. Uh, there wasn't that much going on at that time. Then I came back here in 2008. I was interested to see what had taken place as the agency that I worked for no longer existed. And I haven't been able to find that there's any other such programs uh, that have developed during a time when, you know, Back when I left, we we were totally inadequate in meeting the needs, and and what we had then, I I can't find it now. So I was wondering if you know have those programs disappeared or have they expanded or is they my my experience would say I think they've kind of uh, uh, evolved in different ways um, with homelessness. Um, I know that, uh, of course, there, there's some, sometimes shelter, depending on room and what you category you fall into uh, at the hospital. But there are also, I believe, the veterans that group that started out of the cast shelter downtown yeah. with a separate veteran shelter. I know I couldn't tell you where, but I believe they've opened one or two houses now where they're doing the shelters. I just got a, 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 some mail. I went to my sister's before me. It might be a month old or so. But I got some mail from UMOM, the United Methodist Outreach Ministries. They're, sh they're homeless program down on Van Buren here. They have a veteran-focused uh, program there now, too, taking veterans in. So there are some more benefits that way, um, developing uh, through different groups that are, are, are recognizing a special need. There's, um, I don't know if it still has the, it, it says like the, the YMCA, but it was the women's one. It sits back over here off of Willetta. Um, yeah, back over this way. That one's for homeless veterans, from what I was told. Um, but it still has a W. Why do you Yeah, why do you see A on it? Um, but you'd always see the band over there. I think that's just for homeless veterans. I know you want to know a little more about treatment, uh, treatment of PTSD and so forth, and I can't really speak to much in depth about actual treatment. Uh, I know what I hear from the soldiers. They talk about some of the things that are working or not working for them. But I can tell you that one of the problems, and I don't think this is unique to, to veterans dealing with behavioral health conditions in particular, it's very complex because it's not just about getting the treatment for the illness. It's all the things that go on around that soldier's life. Um, their, their condition may make it difficult or impossible for them to work. How are they going to pay the mortgage? We see that. We see that. We see the families impacted by uh, uh, the breadwinner not winning any bread. Breadwinners having a lot of emotional problems that are alone enough to deal with for the spouse and the children. But now they have income issues. So that becomes uh, problematic. We see some of the symptoms can become problematic. Uh, in one day, about uh, two weeks ago, um, uh, in one afternoon, one of our soldiers, uh, we got a call. Uh, he had gone down to the VA. He had a reaction to seeing other soldiers. He lost it. He, he, he ended up at Davis Monthan, but they couldn't keep him because they couldn't treat him. They're calling us in Phoenix saying, come get your soldier and take him somewhere. 
<laughs> Why don't you take them over to the hospital? You're right there. Well, we don't have, we, we can't do that. But we can't keep them here. Somebody needs to take them. But we can't release them on his own. Well, why not? Well, he's homicidal. <laughs> okay, and you want us to just send somebody over. <laughs> um, in the end, what happened with that soldier is, is a friend came, got into the Tucson Hospital emergency room where he stayed, and then he went to the VA when the, when the VA had some room. So they didn't have room then. You see how difficult that is. And his wife wouldn't come get him. And then she started sending me emails. You know, why does it take so long to get his disability done and get this over with the guard? Why is this taking so long? Um, this is a soldier that has waited three years to get his disability. Oh, oh. What we know? So, so yeah, that's one of the. No, I, I take the bus from all over town and all this stuff. And uh, I run into uh, veterans that are not taking the medication, you know, for uh, the PSPD. And uh, they go, uh, it doesn't work. I don't know, understand. They won't explain the medication to me at the VA. Is there, is the nurses just passing them out without passing the uh, information of the medications or what? You, to take them, you, you should know. see the list of medications. I can't really speak to what they're doing at the yeah, day. I've, 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 I've got soldiers. I've got soldiers. I, I have one. She has more than a dozen medications on her list. Yeah. Wow. Mm. And she's not actually a severe PTSD. She has a combination of physical and emotional problems. And none of it was, not all of it is the military, though the military didn't take care of her. But when she was younger, uh, she lived in Mexico. And her family was a prominent family. She was kidnapped. Abused. So she has all this starts to mix with mm -hmm. deployments, mm -hmm. with the things that he gone through with deployments, with PTSD. <laughs> all starts to mix. Where to start? Um, and all he says in, 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 a, in a sad sort of way is, at least now the army recognizes they have a condition. We're going to help her with, and she's going, to, and she is getting some care. But she she's on on her own to other doctors, yeah. and and she's cut back some of the medication on the advice of other doctors. Uh, who are less prone to do medication, they've given her other alternatives. What can we in our congregations do to support the, our wounded warriors? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, I, 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 I would recommend you contact the Coalition for Military Families, express some interest, and then they, they can get with you and talk about some of the programs they're doing, because that whole one group, their, their office is right across from mine, and in my area where my office is, and they're trying to kick me out of my office to take my office. <laughs> so so uh, they're all around me, and I know most of them, I've known a lot of them for, for, for a few years. Uh, they are dealing with all this, and they are doing all the programs, they're working with hospitals, they're working with agencies, they're working with nonprofits, and they can really help you uh, to, to look at some uh, uh, ways that you can get involved. Because um, they do things with families, spouses, with children, directly with the soldiers, etc. I think yeah. we'll take one more question. Well, I was going to make a comment about the medication. Um, and there are different kinds of medications for different levels, you know. And I was very anti-medication, and I joined a behavioral health group. And I found the medication very helpful. And my question is, you know, is it, is it the resistance of the soldier to take the medication, or um, are they maybe not monitoring the medication? Because right? it's, it's really very helpful despite the side effects. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think you make a good point. First of all, not yeah. nothing works for everybody. Right. And and uh, for instance, uh, one of our soldiers uh, who were able to get back on active duty to get treated so he'd be paid and have benefits for his family and all, he he was in and out of inpatient and medication and so forth for quite a while. And unfortunately. He, he was working full time for the guard, and unfortunately, they, in trying to help him by making sure he still had a job, making sure he still had a place to, to have an income, they really didn't help him because he wasn't, he didn't, never really, we didn't know about him on my side where we deal with the mental health and the physical health problems of the doctors. None of us knew about this soldier. And so for a long time, the soldiers went along going in and out of inpatient treatment, five weeks or five days here, two weeks there, mm -hmm. until finally, the boss has said, oh, we can't have him work anymore. This isn't been working. Well, what do you mean? We find out he's had stuff going along all along. One of the problems that he had, not along with some medication issues, is self-medication. 
And one of the problems is, you go in to get treated and they say, oh, you need, you tre you need treatment for the alcohol. We got to detox you. We need to, you got to take, take care of the alcohol problem. Then we'll take care of PTSD. And you go through that cycle. Mm -hmm. Until finally, you got into a program through the VA. It's a, it's a program up in Prescott where they do it all at once. It's an intensive program over mm -hmm. about seven weeks. And, uh, or maybe nine, but, uh, and, and while he was in that program, I was able to get him back on active duty orders, and now he's gone down to Fort Huachuca, and he's, you know, he's, he's got full uh, income and getting treatment and so forth. So uh, they offered a program that was very intense that allowed him to deal with alcohol and PTSD at the same time. And all I can tell you is from what I hear and talking to soldiers, no one thing works for everybody. Sometimes the medication helps, but some of them tell me stories that they got a medicine to pick them up, and then a medicine to put them down, and I got a medicine to pick them up. I think we we got to call it quits, because okay. we promised people that we would end at 1.15. But I did want to uh, introduce Saria uh, Patricia Lane Hood. And she's from the Episcopal Circle of Friends and the Diocese. Uh, Committee on, uh, for People with Disabilities. And then also uh, Jane McNamara uh, has some visitors. Well, we want have some visitors them? from the Sun City area, and I think they're representing three different churches. So I will let them tell you who they are. Well, great. Do you want to start, Diane? Or maybe you can introduce everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My friend Ruth Flom is from the Unitarian Universalist Church in Surprise, Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Myself and Betty Thiessen are from Faith Presbyterian Church in Sun City. Right. Okay. McClark, Sam and Paul, Carol and <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> almost got it, almost got it. Are from the UCC in Sun City. Right. So we're glad to be here because you do so much good stuff. We wanted to come down and have fellowship with you. Thank you. We'll keep you guys our email. Also, I invited someone from the Grace Lutheran. Uh, I don't know if she's here now. Uh, Bobby Schilling? No, I guess not. Bob, you had a question. What's that? Bob, you had a question. Right, a lot of, there'll be a lot of questions. <laughs> and I would suggest the people stay after. And will, will you be able to stay for a few minutes after? Because it, it's a lot easier just to go up to uh, Philip Shea after the meeting. Uh, because there are certain people who have places to go after this meeting. And we said we would always end as much as possible at 115. So thanks for coming, and let's give uh, Philip Shea a hand.